Adrian, and uh, our next speaker will be Stephen Kavik, Assistant Professor at the University of Maryland, and he will be addressing the ergonomic impact of minimally invasive surgery. What can we do about it? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for your attention, and Drs. Parkenberger, thank you for the privilege of the podium. It's always a pleasure to talk about the surgeon's favorite topic himself, and that's really what it's all about, <laughs> or herself. Thank you. Okay, let's see if we can get back here. Uh, no disclosures today. Minimally, MIS does not stand for minimal impact on the surgeon. We're, we're all aware of this. And it is a real problem, as Dr. Park has just articulated. There's a high rate of musculoskeletal pain and injuries compounded by the problem that as surgeons, we don't like to listen to be told what to do. This is something that sort of sticks in our craw a little bit. And there are a million examples of this, but let's pick one overnight call. This is something that we haven't been doing for weeks or months, but for generations of surgeons, until a New England Journal article came out in December of this past year, a couple of months ago, saying, by the way, when you're awake at night, you're, uh, uh, you may be diminished in terms of your capacity. Maybe we need to consent people differently. And as a result, this sleep study became a wake-up call and has generated a terrific debate over what our role is and abandoning a macho culture of strength and admitting that we may have some limitations. Well, it is really the hope of today to make this a wake-up call for ergonomics in your OR. And we'll focus in on a couple of very key points, posture, the display system, table height, trocar positioning, and instrument handles in just a few minutes. So ergonomics is, of course, the science of the design of equipment to fit the human body but it's more complex in surgery than in other disciplines because it is not only the interface between man and machine, but there's another component. It's man to machine again to man, and I apologize for any gender bias. I will disclose that now. Uh, but uh, uh, when it comes to this, we're acutely aware that our end effectors are not in space doing some mechanical action, but interacting on a person. And so we need to have sensitivity at both ends there are, of course, many differences between minimally invasive surgery and open surgery. The posture is mostly static. We don't tend to move around very much. The visualization is different. The angulation of the fulcrum effect and the limitations of our degrees of freedom are real and impact what we do. And the feedback is, of course, significantly different, if not more limited. When it comes to ergonomics, Dr. Park just detailed his study showing that almost 90% of surgeons suffer physical symptoms and some form of discomfort from what they do for a living. Interestingly, in a separate Italian study, a survey of ergonomic guidelines, 9% of surgeons were even aware that there were ergonomic guidelines for surgery. And then only a third of them applied those guidelines to what they do. So pretty, pretty stark uh, data suggesting that we really are in a, a problem-rich environment, a land of opportunity to get the message out. When it comes to posture, we stand in the OR. That's as basic as it gets. But why do we do that? Is this tradition? It's the way that we did it in open surgery? Is it that we may need to make a quick exit, possibly? respect for the patient or professionalism, that you, you've come here to my OR, I should at least stand, perhaps. Patriotism, I put that in as sort of a gag, but there really is no great answer to this question. But it is convenient. It's efficacious. We know it works. It's very familiar to us. Can't get any cheaper. It's very cost effective. But is it optimal? That we don't know. We do not discuss the stance. Should you put your feet wider apart or closer together? That probably is important, but we don't know. Leg pressures, if I stand on one leg for half the operation and my other leg for the other half, is that better, worse, or different? Resting, uh, bars at the turn of last century had a foot rail. Do we need a step stool that we should put our foot upon at some point during the case? Not to compare the operating room uh, to any sort of a, a pleasure house, but uh, certainly there's a reason that other systems have developed strategies. It's because as human beings, a static posture makes us tired, makes us fatigue, and may impact our ability to do things. But even standing, no matter what your stance is, can be made easier. And in a study involving gel foot pads, 
in 100 cases of laparoscopic nephrectomy, there was decreased foot pain, overall discomfort, and fatigue in the surgeons. So very clearly, in the here and now, using a gel foot pad may be something that you can do to impact your own comfort and perhaps surgical longevity. Now, what about the shoes they wore? Okay, I don't know. Uh, and that wasn't really in the article. And that may have an impact too. Or should we be wearing a clog with a higher heel or an insert that is uh, a, some sort of a gel? This is something that may impact how we operate and how long we can operate. But clearly, no matter how we stand, moving about is even better. Periodically, we can shift, and that will loosen any stiff posture, ward off fatigue, and clearly has been shown to improve both the comfort of the operator as well as the performance of a repetitive act. Well, what about sitting down? As I look out on the comfortably seated audience today, yeah, that, that is a very good position of function. And perhaps an operating seat would be even better. Well, there are prototypes that elevate the surgeon, uh, but certainly none that are widely commercially available. We're also forced with the limitation that the table heights can only drop so far. And many of us have run into that lower limit of the table as we try to adjust uh, our patients. But a chair could be raised or suspended. And is it, is it so outrageous to think that as a life-changing event in surgery that we may borrow from the film industry to have a raised platform that may come down to the patient in order to enable us to do the operations? Of course, my prototype looks a little different, but <laughs> Uh, there are lots of room here. Let's take a look at the robot. This is a seated console present in the here and now. The da Vinci really doesn't add much to many routine procedures that we perform in surgery. It certainly adds time, but its benefits may ultimately be in ergonomics. And in a study that has just come out in Annals of Surgical Oncology, that was the main benefit. When the surgeons were polled, it wasn't operative time or blood loss, it was comfort. Comfort was far and away the number one reason to be thinking about using the da Vinci robot. All right, what about position? Let's take laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Basic laparoscopy, as defined by most any, anyone's standard, but the convention in the United States is to stand at the patient's left side and to reach across not to be in a low lithotomy or a so-called French position standing between the patient's legs. But this is demonstrated now uh, to show increased risk to surgeons, both in terms of physical fatigue as well as the frustration index, the difficulty of, uh, of applying what we want to do to the task at hand. So the change of position from the side to between the legs is really a minimal act that each of us can take home to our own ORs. Well, what of trocar placement? Well, current strategies are really based on our own experience, and we loosely label it as surgeon preference and give some nod to triangulation as a strategy to achieve a target. But what would be ideal would be to apply a more scientific approach to say that there is a depth to the target organ, an angle and length of our instrument that we want to reach that depth, the working angle between instruments, and when you're talking about angles and lines, that's really getting into trigonometry. And that's not a word that we like to use. But trigonometry can provide us some solutions. For hiatal surgery, uh, Fingerhut studied it and said, this is what I think is the most optimal solution. The ports 10 to 14 centimeters from the xiphoid, 10 centimeters on either side of the midline held at a 40 degree angle. And there you are. There may be an optimal solution two procedures that are standardized. Now the hiatus is somewhat fixed, and you say well, that's unfair because we can move some of the other organs around, the colon or intestine, that's true. Um, but the hiatus isn't all that well defined either when you get right down to it, and can be just as variable. But there are solutions that can be derived mathematically, and sometimes the results may surprise, may surprise you. For instance, during pelvic surgery, uh, some surgeons looked at the angle of the spine. And by discovering this, they found that if they leaned forward and to the right against a head support, it kept their spine in better alignment. And they sort of poo-pooed this. That's kind of funny. I get to lay my head down during the operation. But they tried it and said, you know what? This really is a good thing. And so they have adopted a thin head support in routine pelvic surgery as a means of increasing surgeon comfort. Table height. Interestingly, when shown 
different table heights, performance isn't really altered. You can kind of do the same thing up high and down low. But it matters in terms of the strain that it puts on your wrists, your arms, and your back, and your neck. So for minimally invasive surgery, fairly well studied, height should be lower than for that of open surgery, with an optimal height defined for most working surgeons is between 64 and 77 centimeters, with the handles at elbow height to 10 centimeters below. Few of us think about it that way. What is the height of my handle versus the elbow? We're sort of too focused on the screen. But one size does not fit all. And when we change our procedure, we need to change the way we think about it. For instance, when we're doing a laparoscopic dissection and mobilization, but then switch to an extracorporeal anastomosis, you'd better move the table if we're talking about optimizing ergonomics. Hand-assisted surgery is an even different beast where we're trying to do both at the same time. And so from that point of view, you need to achieve more of a compromise in terms of your table height. Monitor positioning has been well discussed. Straight ahead, keeping it in line. Easy to put into a diagram, a little bit more difficult in real life when you're trying to look over the scrub technician or around the resident uh, or the booms sort of beat against each other and you can't quite get the light out of position from the last open case in the room. Can be difficult, but slightly lower than eye level at an appropriate viewing distance. Not too close, not too far away to prevent staring or extensive accommodation seems to be what is optimal. We can also insist on a laparoscopy room. When uh, studied between a tower setup brought into a separate uh, operating room environment versus the more modern laparoscopy suite with the uh, heads up displays, the ones that are ceiling mounted, the neck and the arm pain were significantly decreased and mostly attributable to the movable flat screen technology. So when you're offered that eye room for the last case on a Friday, you can decline and hold out for something better. Handle shape and position is something that is uh, certainly something that is touted by most uh, exhibitors and industry representatives as sort of the key to ergonomics. And, and we know this from experience, that ring handles held tightly uh, create significant pressure areas on the fingers and thumb. And whatever the shape of the handle, it gives you an enforced wrist deviation. This is worse when you're first learning how to do it. No single handle is good for all applications but you can pick the best handle for the particular task in your particular style of operating. One strategy I like to employ is make the fella do it. I don't want to hurt myself. I've got another guy here. So what's he good for anyway? I, so uh, Dr. Park and colleagues did a camera holding assistant study and didn't really address this particular point, but uh, if you hold the camera in a Nissen fund application model, it changes your center of pressure, it changes your weight distribution. The risks are different than for that of the primary surgeon, but it's not risk-free. So you're still bending into awkward postures. In addition to the catecholamine release of watching a fellow operate, you have postural difficulties that you have to deal with yourself. Well, what's on the horizon? Partial automation. This is a prototype device that's just uh, come out. Uh, it's a modification of a conventional suturing assistant device which changed the grip to attach a DC motor controlled via a computer. And basically, instead of having to squeeze handles and flip buttons and turn your wrist in order to pass the stitch, it does it with a single button push. Now this is, of course, a prototype. It's very clunky, but it increases the speed and clearly decreases the torque that is necessary on the hand and wrist. So partial automation may be one strategy to help. But what we know is it's not notes. For all of the press that notes have gotten, we know that there really is sort of uh, a, a knowledge deficit. We don't have all the right platforms, we don't have the experience, and we have a much higher muscular workload when we're attempting it. But our problems are not unique to surgery. Endoscopy, our gastrointestinal colleagues, report similar rates of complications. And they have very specific recommendations in monitor height, patient and provider positioning, as well as recovery time between procedures, something we don't talk about. Our SAGE's guidelines for office endoscopy service uh, discuss facilities, equipment, training, patient monitoring, but not ergonomics specifically. That's, that's a little unfair. We're having this symposium now 
uh, certainly most of the literature is existing in surgical endoscopy. But when we look at other disciplines, they may have some answers. There are ergonomic guidelines for poultry processing. There's a 23-page guide from seven years ago, and from the top down, that looks like me. <laughs> that looks like somebody operating. And it talks about clamps and awkward arm postures and proper workstation height and to, pre to prevent excessive lifting of the arms. Other people are thinking about this. So I apologize for the pun, I really do, <laughs> but not for the thought. Because the thought is we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can build on the work of other disciplines to refine what's already been documented and proven to be safe and efficacious to improve our own ORs. To go from question marks to analysis of viewing distance and angles into what seems to be futuristic or perhaps unnecessary ergonomically designed. So the take home points. What can we do about it? We can stand on a gel pad in the right position. We can move a little. We can lower our table height, use inline monitors, and insist on a lap room. Use the right tool for the right job in the right way and challenge our assumptions as to what really is best for us in terms of ergonomics. It's inherently a physically demanding task, but techniques and countermeasures do exist, and I would encourage you all to think about it because this is certainly an area where we all may contribute. Thank you for your attention.